name's Robert Tepper, and uh, in today's world, I hold the mantle for a, a, a community and a soy food a company called Farm Foods. And I've been asked to talk about the history of the development of uh, some of the soy food products that we developed uh, at our community in Tennessee in the 70s. Stephen was our, uh, was the minister of, a, of our, as you would have a church, and uh, uh, you know, a bright guiding uh, spirit who just helped organize uh, folks into, uh, or not organize, but just helped a lot of folks uh, understand what they were learning in the 60s, what they were experiencing. He was a uh, teacher at the university in comparative religion, which in the 60s took you into uh, a lot of Eastern thought. And uh, his classes got so big, they moved into uh, amphitheaters, rock halls. And that's sort of where the farm came from. He got invited to do a lecture tour and uh, 300 people went with him and the farm was born that way. When, when the tour was over a year later, there was nowhere to park in San Francisco. These folks had been on the road and uh, they moved to just outside of Nashville. My wife and I uh, were living in Nashville and uh, the rest is history. We were a uh, spiritual community. We were 1,500 strong and we were vegan. So we had to figure out how to feed ourselves or how to earn enough to buy what we needed to feed ourselves. And we uh, thoroughly uh, embraced the concept of using soy foods as a primary protein. And we had literally dozens of excellent chefs and cooks in their private homes in this community perfecting recipes. I get to talk about them, but uh, the developers, you, they all know who they are. Uh, I'll drop names later. So we liked to eat soy foods and we built a dairy early on and uh, people could go and pick up milk and fresh tofu. Uh, we then expanded that dairy and uh, really as the community grew, our tofu production grew. We had some uh, super smart technicians and great equipment uh, uh, scavengers. And we built a really nice soy dairy there in Tennessee, Summertown, Tennessee, and developed a lot of soy foods that we liked to eat. Fast forward to uh, the reality of earning a living in Tennessee, we needed to uh, figure out how to make our food that we were loving and was not on the market, how we could make that accessible. And lo and behold, somewhere six, 74, five, maybe five, six, we opened a uh, a place in San Francisco. We had in, uh, in Marin County, in, in San Rafael. We had the first vegetarian restaurant in San Rafael, probably in the Bay Area, but certainly there. That, and we uh, had a restaurant and a bookstore and a, a small production plant in the back. Again, fast forward a couple of years later, having uh, developed delivery routes to the primary restaurants, the vegetarian folks uh, who were happy to buy our tofu. So uh, we expanded on the production and what was, two things were making us very popular. One was the fact that we developed firm press tofu. When we got to the Bay Area, 
it was Hanodi, Kwanghap, uh, and Azamaya, uh, you know, Korean, Chinese, and, uh, and Japanese tofu, and then it was us. And the white kids let the presses squeeze longer, and our tofu was chewier and a little more uh, what a Caucasian palate prefers rather than soft tofu, which was the going trend at those points. So we developed firm press tofu, distributed it in five gallon buckets and got a nice packaging machine. And then before you knew it, we were crushing the tofu and making tofu cheesecakes. We were making tofu salads, uh, cottage cheese, all with tofu. And uh, so running a community and a bookstore and a restaurant makes profitability kind of tricky. So we closed down, rented a building in San Francisco, right on King Street, where the stadium is now, right on that corner. And uh, for two, three years, we had a soy foods production facility, a sizable one. We brought out some really smart engineers. Frank came in and built a scaffold uh, tofu process. And, uh, you know, where the forklift put the beans in at the top. This is no rocket science, but no one had done this. And the beans would gravitationally go through their cleaning, go through their splitting, go through their soaking. And the backs of the workers, it's a very back heavy industry, uh, were being saved as best we could to get it down to the final, uh, you know, the, the cooking, the kettles were in line. It was just really smart. We had a viewing room up above the, as many uh, little factories do. And uh, all our competitors would come over because they were hearing about this, you know, pyramid we built. And we'd have to frisk them down for cameras and, you know, really watch them close and chase them out. But uh, so that was farm foods. So we did that for a while. Before we even did the restaurant and the soy foods factory, we had farm foods out of Tennessee selling uh, good tasting nutritional yeast, which many of you remember, the Red Star brand. We were the first to buy it from them in Wisconsin and repackage it. But we also had TVP. We were pioneering texturized vegetable protein. Uh, we were the first to really pioneer it into the natural food stores and uh, overcome the uh, arguments about the uh, hexane extractions and all the issues that are out there with texturized vegetable protein. Uh, as a food source, we didn't take the pickiest of uh, discrimination on that one. Maybe today I'd look different at it, but at the point, no one was selling a, a helper, hamburger helper. And we felt that our mission, and we were mission-based, was to contribute dramatically to the world's hunger problem by educating what you can do with soy foods. So we had, you know, pamphlets that were given out at the stores called Yay Soybeans. And uh, we, uh, as a sideline, we had a, a, a book publishing company and we started publishing Tofu Cookery, uh, the Farm Vegetarian Cookbook Classics. Those recipes are as good today as they were uh, 40 years ago. So now we've got a brand, we've got a factory in San Francisco. And once again, we look at the numbers and the people we have committed and the only money was in ice bean.
So we had developed throughout this all at home uh, ice cream. We wanted ice cream. Everyone wants ice cream. So we had some of the more talented people, Roberta, Robert Dolgen, Michael Mormon, guys who just could make things taste great. Uh, Roberta Kaczynski was uh, sort of the head of our house kitchen and uh, in some ways chief cook. I learned so much from her. Uh, along the way together, we opened a vegetarian restaurant in Nashville. That was uh, 82. And uh, the best chefs all trained me up. That was a great experience. Uh, Lori Praskin. So these folks were making tofu products at home uh, or in our kitchens on the farm. And uh, we made them into products. So back to the commercial aspect of farm foods, uh, we were now only distributing in California and we were kind of pulling out, though a lot of our products were made available by uh, some of our members who stayed back and, and kept the distribution going for a while. Uh, and we, had, we ran routes through Georgia and Tennessee uh, selling products, but that was, you know, we only had a sliver of the country. Some UPS orders on our yeast and TVP, and we knew we could do more. So the decision was to shut down the factory in California after, I'm not sure, two, three years, and move the operation back to the heartland, uh, all, and go national with our frozen ice cream. We were shipping from San Francisco to Tree of Life in Florida uh, in rented vans. I mean, there, it was really early on in uh, small load frozen distribution. So we moved our factory to uh, a, a dairy outside of Memphis, Searcy, Arkansas, who was willing, it wasn't easy, to find uh, a dairy that would shut down, sanitize, and run limited amounts of product from soy. And uh, Michael Mormon and Steve Myers, I think the job they did finding a dairy and working with someone to do something extremely out of the uh, norm. And, uh, you know, we were the first. Tofuti was still in the kitchen in the Bronx or Brooklyn, uh, you know, that's another story. But later later came to a foodie. But at first, so we got the jump and, uh, and we did a great job. We got uh, an ice cream distribution partnership with haagen just by being a good sales folks and negotiators at the right time in the right place. And that popped us into many haagen distribution networks where uh, I would go make sales calls with the haagen guy and they don't get no for an answer. So we gained a lot of distribution really quick. Backtracking, we had raised two or three million dollars on a public offering, separated the company from the community and spent the next eight or nine years in grocery distribution and very much popularizing uh, soy foods. We had ice bean in the health food stores, which was made with honey. And we had tofu light in the grocery stores, because in those days you had to have two. It certainly has changed, but we chose to have two different brands and we did good for years and years. The point was not uh, vegan. The point wasn't even vegetarian. The point was cholesterol free. You could eat that ice cream with a bad heart. And we did great until Seal Test figured out how to get all the cholesterol out of their ice cream, which tasted great. And no matter how many years and how good we were, I'm sorry to say this, at the end of the day, it tasted like soybeans, you know? So we were very popular for 
half a decade or more and certainly popularized the brand for years to come. And those products were, uh, you know, duplicated because uh, we weren't the only ones doing it. When we were in the grocery stores, we were also in both ballparks in uh, New York City selling soy milk ice cream. We had two seasons. We, me and Steve, we had a, a pass to get in and go down into the basement of the ballpark and check out the inventory. And we sold a mix and had rented equipment. So, you know, that was the, the height of the popularity. We got into the tempe business early. Uh, our pH scientist who did, really helped us open our first soy foods factory uh, got involved with a professor in Indonesia. And before long, we were the Im exclusive importer of tempe spores from Indonesia and built the lab and marketed them. We sold spores out of our lab, Cynthia Bates, God bless her, for years to uh, Michael at Light Life, to uh, Steve Demos at, at uh, Silk, that company. <laughs> for years and years, we had this Tempe Spore factory. We still do, we still have online business. Tempe, is different. Tempe is a is a spore, a living organism that sort of is in the air. We're told in Indonesia, and uh, it's a primary food. So you take a soybean, you split it, you put it on a cookie sheet, and you sprinkle the spores on it. Put it in a warm oven overnight, and in the morning you've got a bed that is coagulated and you slice it up and fry it or steam it. And the book publishing company have a wonderful Tempe cookbook out there for anyone who wants some guidance. And, uh, and there's real good Tempe. There's, there's uh, you know, the names we keep hearing, Light Life. Uh, he started in Tempe. He learned on the farm and built that company and then exploded into many other products as he uh, sold his Tempe business and got big. And, you know, White Wave certainly has been, you know, the, the other one that's always been there. They're still there and it's good Tempe. And, uh, you know, we're fortunate there's a local Tempe guy here who makes just the best Tempe. Uh, but it's only available, you know, half a dozen stores if you live in Santa Rosa. <laughs> but the, com you know, the, the two commercial brands are pretty much everywhere now. Lots of shelf life and it's good. So you should get some and steam it up and then uh, cut it in strips and fry it. Mm. what the distributors and retailers had to do with the growth. And I'm saying they responded to the consumer and, uh, and that growth keeps happening. You know, Safeway, for, which is a hard nut to crack, uh, and Publix, they have sections now that say meat alternatives. And for the most part, they're soy, gluten. I mean, it's growing. It's, uh, you know, when the pandemic started and you couldn't buy toilet paper in Northern Cal, you couldn't find tofu. It would come in on Sunday night and be gone Monday morning. Uh, tofu became one of those uh, hot numbers that took them a while to ramp up. And they started importing it from the East Coast more. Little companies are always uh, bought out by big companies. Most little companies I've worked with, and there have been dozens over the years as a consultant, they want to build it and sell it. So the, the small guys don't buy up the small guys. Who would have thought you could have a tofurkey? He gets first prize. 
to to where you know three five years into it he couldn't make enough i think he's ramped up but but you know there are certain brands i mean look what white wave did they as soon as they put milk in a gable uh milk carton it exploded suddenly everyone could take home soy milk instead of uh not liking it in tetra pack you know on the shelf they put it in a gable and stuck it in the cooler and it just i don't know what the number is but a huge growth so what are we saying what caused the growth the big guys get to do it by making moves you know they uh silk had the white wave had the shelf space they were controlled at that point i think by dean or somebody with tremendous distribution arms and the soy foods went on the shelf and you know what the consumer bought it and almond next you know the vegetarian movement is strong and uh, and it's still soy based i have managed a lot of brands unfortunately not white wave or uh, light life the other one i was going to mention michael cohen and the light life company uh you know eves up in canada these those were the the spearheaders farm foods when we were on the market uh we always had the ice cream part of it but you know those making hot dogs to where they were good to where you could actually you know buy them from the vendor in front of the flower uh gardens in San Francisco Park, you know, in Golden Gate Park. I just saw them there recently. Uh everywhere. It's expensive. If you have a good product and you're willing to pay the grocers to buy that rent that shelf space, you might be successful. The demand is there. The available shelf space, it's all negotiable, you know. It's all negotiable. And you can make a brand without the big boys. You don't have to go into the grocery stores. Sprouts is just as expensive as uh, Safeway. Whole Foods is more expensive than Safeway. So it's uh you, you know that that somewhat uh prunes out some brands is that, you know, unfortunately it's it it takes an investment to build a brand and to uh, buy in. So I did it primarily on my uh, charming personality and good looks and I tried to find companies that were worth selling and who could support what I knew. So a lot of my job over the years has been helping clients uh not be forced into overspending, knowing what you can get away with. You know, I had that that multiple brand advantage of saying, but Miss Safeway, the last guy paid this and you want two of those and can't have that, you know. Can't say that if you just walk in the door. So, you know, I I have a little bit of tenor, tenure and uh and and enough sass left in me that I try to uh, tell them what they should do with a great brand. We all like to sell what the consumer wants. We we were there when tofu was just gaining popularity. Uh dramatically different than today where you go into Safeway and there's three or four brands. Let alone, you know, a health food store. So as people became more conscious of their health, as you know, soy foods uh became more popular. and uh you know a retailer wants to give folks what they want and folks were making it organic and clean uh you know we may have been the first to uh you know tetra pack or not tetra pack whatever they call it cryo pack tofu the way tofu's packed in a tray a little dish uh we did cheesecakes in tofu trays man we pressed the tofu down and then we with and that with graham cracker crust underneath and then we put in the the whipped tofu and fruit 
People of San Francisco had a real treat for a couple, three years. Those were great products, but commercially to expand it, uh-uh. It just wasn't, wasn't in, in our abilities. As the demand is there, the retailers will sell them what they want and the distributors follow the trend. I mean, it's the consumer that steers the food industry, despite what they tell you. Uh, if, it, if folks want it, it'll get there. And so soy foods just grew and grew. And then there were some wonderful pioneers, you know, from uh, Steve Demos at White Wave, Michael Cohen at Light Life, just expanding the product selections for folks, inspired folks. So that, I guess, overviews the, the basic question, you know, and, and I get to be the representative of this, you know, I could line a six or eight people behind me. They've all kind of disappeared from the commercial side of things, uh, but boy, they deserve the credit. So as a community, we developed our products, we developed our standards, uh, we knew what tasted good, and we also knew that, uh, you know, an acre of land can produce a, a pound of beef and a 10 pounds of soy foods. And, uh, you know, that was, that's, we were, we were out to show folks that soy foods were good between our products, which came and went. We eventually weren't selling tofu products. We are again, Farm Foods has been resurrected. Uh, you have to live in Middle Tennessee or in Georgia to get it, but you could get it if you lived there. Uh, but we, we wrote books and we published books and we distributed books on soy foods and we certainly took the ice cream category into the next level. And uh, a quote that's delightful, I wish I could give you a date. Uh, vegetarian times, at one point said, quote, the farm changed the way America ate soy foods. <laughs>